Yeah, good morning, everyone. Lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, I'm very pleased of the opportunity to speak to you today and um, really looking forward to these very fascinating discussions I'm sure we will be having during these two days. And uh, thank you so much for Professor Monet for making an excellent uh, introduction to this uh, conference. So, uh, Today what I'm going to talk about is uh, going to be based upon uh, yeah, the book uh, that I co-authored with my uh, fantastic colleague from Italy, Giovanna Mascheroni, and uh, it's uh, exactly about uh, fitting uh, to this uh, conference. It examines how AI and uh, data and uh, algorithms, uh, how they start to transform children's lives in the present day world. So uh, I hope to give you a short overview of uh, how this datafication of children's lives happens and also potentially start to talk about the potential consequences of this. Um, so in order to start off, uh, it's important to say uh, that Present-day society is a mediatized society, uh, which means that uh, media and various media technologies have really become ubiquitous. They are surrounding us everywhere. They are invasive in a sense that they cannot be fully uh, ignored uh, or avoided, even though many people try to unblock themselves or do some detoxes once in a while. And many media technologies have also become invisible so that they have merged uh, with all aspects of our lives. So in short, as in the present day world, as uh, Professor Sonia Livingstone and Alicia Bloom Ross have argued, media have become environmental, being embedded in a significantly constitutive of um, today's uh, practices, relationships and institutions. So how does it work? We um, live in smart cities. We drive smart cars. Our homes are smart as they are filled with uh, smart gadgets. Our fridges notify us when our uh, milk has gone bad. And uh, robot uh, vacuum cleaners keep our houses tidy with us putting any effort on it. Our phones are filled with various apps which keep an eye on our calorie intake. Uh, sleep and mood patterns, finances, mental health, relationships, and tons of other things. We can buy smart toys to our children to keep them entertained and occupied, or we can buy them smart clothing and smart uh, uh, footwear items uh, that could provide them with directions when they might get lost. And in fact, if we'd like, we could even turn our own bodies into platforms uh, by implanting microchip implants underneath the skin. And uh, then we wouldn't need to worry about leaving our keys or cash or um, cards home ever again. So these uh, few examples illustrate that datafication is both an outcome and also intensify of uh, deep mediatization. An outcome uh, insofar as almost each and every social action and interaction is now mediatized and generates data traces, but also an accelerator of mediatization as algorithmic based automations increasingly characterize and structure the everyday opportunities for interaction and agency. We thus live also in a society where datafication and that is massive and systematic monitoring, recording, and transformation of social actors' everyday practices online and offline has become a normalized practice. Datafication is premised on the belief that human behavior and increasingly emotions can be monitored, quantified, predicted, and ultimately molded. The profitable appropriation and manipulation of data rests on a process of abstraction of the messiness of everyday life into abstract categories. Data extraction and abstraction involves a process of translation in which what is lost, ultimately, is our subjectivity, 
that comes to be configured as a flaw against the background of data, datafication. In fact, algorithmic classifications do not aim at providing authentic representations of individual users, but effective models that allow predictive anticipations of such users' future behavior. Children's Commissioner for England stated a few years back that children growing up today are among the first to be datafied from birth. Children generate an unprecedented ongoing flow of personal and behavioral data that are being harvested, analyzed, manipulated, and commodified. It is estimated that the average child is exposed to up to two million online trackers per year, which collect around five million data points. Well, children obviously do not encounter automated data collection and algorithmic calculation systems only as a result of their own direct engagement with digital media. But the datafication of childhood is further expanded by two simultaneous and interdependent developments, namely the mediatization of parenthood and the domestication of Internet of Things devices. So in the contemporary neoliberal world, it is often assumed that Parental competencies cannot be only taught and learned, but also purchased and consumed. During the big data era of marketing, advertising, the data from prospective mothers has come to mean lucrative business for big corporations, data companies, and retail stores, like Target, uh, which developed its notorious pregnancy prediction score already 10 years ago. So while the future mothers are actively Googling for health advice, looking for some ideas for how to decorate a nursery, or posing their baby bump selfies in Instagram, the datafication of the unborn has become unavoidable. Many pregnant women have become used to using pregnancy apps without acknowledging the amount of personal data these apps leave behind. Studies indicate that such apps can be sharing user data not only with advertisers, but also with employers and insurance companies. Even though many parents are making use of these reproductive health trackers on a voluntary basis, the commodified form of data relations that these devices evoke bind its users tightly into surveillance capitalism. The mediatized performance of parenthood continues after birth, where in the form of sharenting or through the use of parenting apps and wearables to monitor infants' health, track their sleeping or feeding patterns. Baby tech companies promise that your baby can sleep soundly in AI-abled bouncing creeps. And even if they happen to wake up, you can buy a portable sound machine, which will sush them uh, back into sleep without you needing to do a thing. Well, even diapers have become smart nowadays, meaning your phone app will notify you when your child pees uh, in the diaper, <laughs> and only then you can um, turn and act. So such mediatized parenting practices have been labeled intimate surveillance or caring data valence to emphasize the entanglement of caring and data valence in the contemporary practices and imaginaries of good parenting. Participation in the data valence of their babies is premised on emerging social expectations and shared norms around parenthood, a moral epistemology for which parents are encouraged to first conform to a normative pattern of digital parenting, whereby tracking babies and children is socially constructed as the norm of good parenting. Second, trust the data that parenting apps and wearable devices uh, gives back as objective, accurate, reliable, contrary to mothers and fathers' defective and deceptive knowledge. And thirdly, to act on such data-based knowledge in order to ensure the child's health, well-being, and development. However, once parenting practices become mediatized and increasingly reliant on technologies of caring and sharing, they become simultaneously imbued with a very data-driven business logic. 
present-day parents have also started to use tracking apps and wearables to keep an eye on their children offline and online encounters. Marketers ensure that anxious parents, um, that by making the right consumer choices, parents can actually make the world a better and uh, definitely a safer place for their children. Such a protective and connected stance, however, can lead to no risk culture, altering and limiting children's experiences. In fact, interviews with preteens from Estonia whose parents make use of tracking technologies indicate that some children uh, in our sample wholeheartedly believed that it was purely their parents' duty to be responsible for their well-being and safety. Interviews with Estonian parents, however, suggest that many of the parents have really bought a marketing myth that these tracking technologies enable them to reduce or even eradicate all risks for their children. At the same time, in most homes of our study participants, there was absolutely no discussion about whether such apps should be used or why parents consider them important. Internet-connected AI-based technologies are also reconfiguring our domestic environments. We no longer live just in media-saturated home, but in a data-saturated home. These sensing networks of connected things collect, uh, create and distribute an increasing variety of so-called home life data, whereby every single piece of human experience, including the intimacy uh, and privacy of home and family life, is turned into profitable materials for the industry. Thus, we can see complex power dynamics at play here. We use data-based artifacts that actually use us. Although the data are generated as part of our usage practices, they are sent, interpreted, and reacted on elsewhere. Therefore, these technologies operate on the basis of an invisible data transmission over which our control is limited or non-existent, leaving us to question established notions of human and machine agency. Well, of course, we should not see parents' questionable consumer choices as the reason why present children are datafied. Datafication should also be seen as a practice of the self that children sometimes unconsciously and sometimes consciously engage in. For example, smartphones capture much data automatically without requiring any manual input from its user. At other times, however, we may consciously and voluntarily decide to engage in self-tracking. Empirical studies with young self-trackers indicate that young people acknowledge and value the affordances these technologies provide as they enable to gain insights about their physical and mental health, most of which would uh, have uh, otherwise remained hidden and imperceptible. Uh, scholars argue that there is a strong pedagogical element embedded within the design and public discourses around wearables, as by engaging in self-tracking, individuals are invited to follow a neoliberal self-optimization discourse by taking greater control of their lives. And well, last but definitely not least, datafication of children happens on a large scale in educational settings, as we already heard. So the discussions about these te revolutionary powers of technology that are often blended with this enthusiastic techno-optimism promising to reimagine the education have been ongoing for decades. Biometric technologies such as fingerprint readers, facial recognition software, palm vein scanners, iris scanning devices, heart rhythm detectors, typing metrics, voice biometrics, that are applied in educational institutions all over the world serve as an illustration of how students' personal information is vigorously harvested for a multitude of reasons. Beyond tracking student bodies in physical environments, facial recognition is also used in various virtual learning contexts. For example, as a means for authenticating learners, controlling their access to learning environments, or for controlling student integrity during online tests and exams. There is also a growing interest in affective computing, which relies on the development of biometric technologies, which can monitor and collect physio physiological data from the students, so as to surveil their engagement in learning. 
The techniques of effective computing could include speech analysis applications that are able to detect emotion from human voice, as well as textual sentiment analysis that can be performed through natural language processing, tone and linguistic analysis. Most commonly, though, facial analysis and machine vision algorithms are used for detecting so-called facial micro-expression states, that is, facial states lasting less than half a second. The information gained through such scanning is believed to provide insights into what learners are thinking, as well as being used as indicators of students' engagement or non-engagement, acting as evidence of frustration, surprise, delight, confusion, or boredom. None of these technological advancements, however, provide an option for the students to self-curate and restrict what data they share. In, this light, uh, in the light of these developments, uh, the work of teachers also becomes data managed, subject to normative processes of algorithmic exposure and measurement. Not only is there a need to make changes in the curricula and pedagogies to ensure that students develop and grow in the measured categories, but also the autonomy and expertise of the teacher is seriously minimized, as they no longer have them to make pedagogical decisions, but rather manage technology that is making the decision for them. And uh, a recent example uh, of the above is exactly this A-levels exam grading algorithm fiasco for, from the UK, uh, where algorithm uh, started to be used so as to escape the very subjective decisions uh, from um, uh, teachers. So in conclusion, um, in the book, uh, Giovanni Mascheroni and myself argue that datafication not only redefines the very boundaries of social knowledge, what we are able to know, but more significantly, what is worth knowing about our social world is what can be abstracted into and represented through data. Conversely, what eludes the conversion into quantifiable data and its algorithmic classification is not relevant and ultimately doesn't exist. Yet despite the fact that in the ideology of dataism constructs data as so-called natural traces and the platforms or sensors through which they are extracted as so-called neutral facilitators, the discourses and systems of data harvesting and algorithmic processing carry a number on built-in systemic biases. Algorithmic classifications oftentimes generate stereotyped identities, which influence both the impressions that others form about us, as well as our own self-image. Representational harms thus affect not only the redistribution of and access to resources and opportunities, but also one's self of self. In fact, when algorithmic classifications are returned to us in the form of advertisements, suggestions for cultural products or allocative harms, they shape in turn our horizons of expectations and practices. Ultimately, Datafication turns children into always present but invisible data subjects. As a result, they are not only positioned with partial and reductionist data templates, they are also represented and spoken for in ways they cannot understand or control. Within the process of datafication and algorithmic translation then, as argued by Deborah Lapton and Ben Williamson, the embodied and subjective voices of children are displaced by the supposed impartial objectivity provided by the technological mouthpieces of data. Throughout the book, Giovanna and myself have made the argument that the consequences of datafication for children cannot be fully speculated, but are likely to be serious. When the future is decided by algorithms predicting the probability of success at university, or their suitability for a job, or their likely recidivism, and therefore their inclusion in re-education programs. Inequalities are introduced in their very access to resources and opportunities. Moreover, 
When algorithms are programmed based not only on children's data, but also their parents' inequities and discriminations come to be systematically reproduced, conditioning children's entitlement to social, civic, and political rights. Therefore, we argue that the datafication of childhood involves more than a threat to children's privacy. What is at stake is the future of human agency and ultimately of society and culture in the context of the material practices and infrastructures, our automation and algorithmic governance. Children make up one third of the overall internet population and are usually conceived of as digital pioneers. Yet the internet, uh, as argued by Sonia Livingstone and Amanda Third, has been largely conceived implicitly or explicitly as an adult resource in terms of provision, regulation, and ideology. In fact, embedding children's interest in the design of the digital world has long been considered to be complicated and expensive. Moreover, till very recently, regulative frameworks have either neglected children or whenever children are taken into consideration as rights holders, focus on protection alone. Convention of the Rights of the Child declares that children have the right to have their views heard in matters that affect them. Children's panels participating in recent policy processes have voiced their need for the digital environment to support, promote, and protect their safe and equitable engagement, and emphasized the concerns related to the use of their data. We are thus at an opportune moment to enable children's voices to be heard, to enable them to share their doubts, concerns, and hopes about datafication. Thus, us as adults should make conscious choice to involve them in developing new technologies, apps, and platforms, as well as before, while making decisions to use the data they generate. Only then, we can start to imagine and build a future in which data are repurposed for the social good and best interest of the child. Thank you. Thank you very much. The world is Big Brother has really arrived. <laughs> um, we have uh, time for maybe one or two very quick questions before we break for coffee, which I'm sure you're all waiting for. We have a question. We have one here at the back. So again, just wait till you get the microphone. Thank you very much for your presentation. A uh, very interesting approach and kind of stance towards certification. I would like to just ask you through your research, which has a very particular kind of focus and uh, way of uh, doing it, what do you think is the best way to use data in a solid, I would say, an ethical way? Because you criticize a lot that, that the, um, the process of datification of, of children and of society, which is, of course, happening. So how can we make sure that apart from involving children in discussions, which has also other ramifications of it because every child is an individual, they have different opinions, etc. How can we make sure that we use data and children use data in a way that is ethically sound? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think m much of the recipes were already given by uh, Professor Monet uh, in, uh, in her talk. Um, I think the first questions we should be uh, asking ourselves is that, uh, do we need to collect all that data? Uh, do we have a concrete plan how to use that data? Do we have an idea why this data could be uh, useful? Uh, not just uh, randomly trying to collect everything in the hopes that perhaps this can be uh, useful uh, someday in the future. So um, I, uh, I'm afraid currently there is a lot of data uh, uh, collection which, uh, which isn't done with a real good, like uh, there isn't a very concrete purpose behind it. So... Um, 
And uh, obviously to uh, design technologies where uh, students and, and children in general could have an opportunity to opt out from this various uh, data valence that is happening in their lives. Uh, because in, in many uh, places currently there is no opportunity for them to do so. And, uh, and again, they talk about uh, literacy, to provide children with data literacy and algorithmic literacies, uh, the same as we need to provide these skills to adults. But, uh, but for uh, uh, young people, they desperately need those as well, because currently still the dominant uh, ideology uh, uh, seems to be that uh, I don't have nothing to hide. So you can take my data as long as I can use some platforms for free or can have some apps for free. And uh, I, I'm not a criminal. I haven't done anything wrong. So um, please take my data because they simply are totally unaware of how this could be applied and used in totally different contexts that could later affect their lives. <laughs> 